So this is going to be an overview of what we call peripheral vascular disease and uh, sort of go through things um, here and take notes and ask questions as needed. So um, <coughs> sort of as an introduction, this will be sort of blood vessels 101. What are the blood vessels? Then what is vascular surgery? And then move into peripheral vascular disease um, and looking at arteries and veins as well. So um, some of this uh, folks may know, but arteries are, are the blood vessels that carry the oxygenated blood from the heart. Um, so within the arteries, the blood flows under high pressure. Uh, these blood vessels have pretty thick elastic walls, and they don't have any valves within them. And that differs from the veins. So the veins, sorry, um, always are uh, depicted in blue in most drawings that you see. And that's supposed to represent the fact that these carry the deoxygenated blood back to the heart. So arteries away from the heart, veins uh, towards the heart. Uh, veins are reliant on your muscles to squeeze and push the blood back, so they flow under pretty low pressure. Uh, veins compared to arteries are pretty thin-walled, um, non-elastic, meaning they don't uh, compress as well. And they do have valves within them, which will become important later on when we talk about dysfunction of these veins. So um, just a little background on what vascular surgeons are or what vascular surgeons do. So um, they're trained as surgeons to evaluate and treat really all aspects of blood vessel disease throughout the body. Uh, and we use uh, surgical techniques, obviously, by the title, uh, but some non-surgical techniques as well. Uh, the really one exception is, and uh, to explain it, is that we basically do every blood vessel but the heart. And the heart, as probably people know, are treated generally by cardiologists or cardiothoracic surgeons if you need something like a heart bypass. So in terms of diseases that we see as vascular surgeons or treat, uh, so peripheral arterial disease is one of the sort of the big ones, the mainstay of it. And this is really, and we'll get to this later, but blockages not only in your lower extremities but in your arms as well. We see aneurysmal disease where blood vessels have gotten bigger than they once should be. Um, blockages in your carotid arteries that feed the brain and carry a risk of stroke. Uh, mesenteric, meaning the blood vessels that feed the intestines as well as the kidney arteries. Um, and then aortic disease. Aorta is the biggest blood vessel that you have. Comes off your heart, goes down into your belly, and splits into two. And the uh, aorta is prone to get aneurysms as well, again, where the blood vessel gets much bigger than it should be. Uh, and then as well, it's called the dissection, where the blood vessel layers can separate, causing issues with getting blood supply to important organs. In terms of the veins, we treat deep vein thrombosis, which is essentially blood clot within your vein, uh, varicose veins. Uh, we do things with hemodialysis axis, so patients that require dialysis for kidney failure, they often need what's called an AV fistula or an AV shunt through which they get dialysis, uh, so we do that. Vascular trauma, where blood vessels gets injured, get injured, and a few other things here, lymphatics and uh, what's called vasculitides. And so how do we do these things? So a lot of what we do is based on non-invasive testing, so meaning um, ultrasounds like the let me just figure out which one of these is the pointer or the top one. So ultrasounds that we do with um, you know, the same machine that we do to look at bellies and also look at the heart, we can look at the blood vessels of the leg. Uh, we still do some open surgery. We do endovascular surgery that we'll get into the details later, but sort of less invasive ways of treating blockages in blood vessels. And then there's a good amount of medical management that along with primary care physicians get involved in, in giving certain medications and uh, modifying certain things. So uh, in terms of a typical week of what a vascular surgeon does, uh, a couple of days a week seeing patients as outpatients, a few days doing procedurals, and again, some combination of those old-fashioned, I won't say old-fashioned, but open surgery, which is more conventional, and these endovascular procedures. And then usually sort of one extra day of doing various things. And as sort of demonstrated today, so there are some emergencies associated with this field, so sometimes you have to do things more urgently than not. So just again, a little more background, so how to get to become a vascular surgeon. Um, so everybody goes through college and medical school and sort of the old fashioned way of doing it, which is what I did. You do uh, general surgery, so you're trained to, to do everything across the body, belly surgery, intestinal surgery, and then you do what's called a fellowship, essentially two more years of training after that. Um, more and more these days we're seeing um, these programs where straight from medical school you can then go into this field of vascular. So it shortens the length of it, but importantly it emphasizes uh, the field more. So a lot of what people traditionally learned in, in general surgery you no longer use, and the field has really separated itself, so we, we have this new training method. All right, so that's just a little bit of background on sort of what vascular surgery is and, and arteries and veins, so sort of the, hopefully the language throughout is consistent here. 
So peripheral arterial disease, we're going to take a look at in depth here and, and look at the prevalence, what the risk factors are for developing this, how it's diagnosed, and then how it's ultimately treated. So just sort of from definition standpoint, uh, this is a really an occlusive disorder of the arteries affecting the arms and legs. So um, blockages leading to occlusions, meaning block, uh, complete blockages, to be clear. It can also affect the uh, arteries, like I said, what's called the mesenteric arteries. These are the blood vessels that feed the intestines as well as the kidneys. And then uh, grouped into this are the carotid arteries and the vertebral arteries. So these are the blood vessels that feed the brain and can lead to things like stroke or mini stroke. So I think it's important that uh, peripheral arterial disease in general has a lot of different names, particularly sort of, you know, when you're surfing the internet or from a newspaper article. So you'll hear these same terms and it's sort of uh, all the same thing. So atherosclerosis is simply the name of what happens to hardening of the arteries. So along the same line, you'll hear things called blocked arteries, hardening of the arteries, stiffing of the arteries. Um, all these things are due to plaque buildup. So people refer to, oh, I have plaque buildup in my blood vessels. And then the abbreviation you'll often see is PAD, so peripheral arterial disease, and then PVD, which is peripheral vascular disease. So it's a little bit of semantics, but vascular does include the arteries and the veins. So uh, PAD is probably the most specific of what we're going to talk about. So PAD, peripheral arterial disease, throughout the rest of this. <clears throat> so in terms of this, uh, this occurs essentially uh, very similar to what happens in the heart. So you have extra cholesterol or fat that's circulating in your blood. This leads to little collections on the sides of the blood vessel walls, uh, which ultimately can lead to blockages. So, you know, this can affect your quality of life just the way that obviously, you know, interruption of blood supply to your heart, uh, interruption to your legs or arms can lead things like making uh, walking difficult. And we'll show this a little bit later, but certainly when you have blockages in blood vessels of your legs or arms, it's a marker that you have blockages to some degree uh, in your heart as well as in your carotid arteries. So this is a marker, not just that we worry about your legs, but once you have this, we get concerned about uh, your heart as well as your uh, carotid arteries. So we worry about heart attacks and stroke. So it's a marker for disease that we'll see a little bit later. So, you know, um, this is sort of an awareness uh, lecture, I guess. And so what we really want to do, and I've given this talk to primary care physicians, but you want to think of this disease because often it's sort of ignored or not thought about early in the process. And we really want to help folks uh, get to preventing the long-term disability associated with this, restoring your walking ability, and stopping the progression of disease. And then along with this, there's a lot of uh, systemic treatments, so medications that help lower your risk of heart attack and stroke as well. This is just a little schematic, and so this is uh, showing a normal blood vessel, and this is very similar to, again, uh, the heart, where you start to have buildup of plaque here. So this is a combination of cholesterol, some calcium, et cetera, that leads to narrowing of the artery. And when you have narrowing of the artery, you don't have normal blood supply essentially downstream into the leg. So is this a common thing? Is this rare? So in general, this is a little bit dated now, and it affects about 20 million people in the U.S. Uh, so it's a, it's a disease of people that are over the age of 50, particularly, but certainly those that are uh, over the age of 70 and 80 and 90. And obviously, as people are living longer and longer, we're seeing more and more of this disease. Um, and you can see here, too, it's, it's a disease of diabetics. We see about one in three diabetics over the age of 50 have some degree of peripheral arterial disease. And importantly, this, again, is a little bit dated slide, so these numbers are bigger now. So a lot of patients have this disease and are asymptomatic from it, in which case, again, it's really just a marker for uh, concerns about having heart attacks and strokes, so they should be treated uh, with the normal, normal medications, uh, meaning particularly antiplatelet therapy or specifically an aspirin a day, cholesterol-lowering medications to help lower the risk, again, primarily of heart attack and stroke. Um, there are symptomatic patients that come on to get treated, and then, importantly, uh, there's a large number of patients that are symptomatic but untreated. And again, I think this is a disease that is often under-recognized or recognized sort of late in the process before, um, you know, things can be done uh, a little more easily. So what are the risk factors? Um, so, you know, not dissimilar from, again, coronary artery disease affecting the heart. So tobacco abuse above and beyond is sort of the number one risk factor. And uh, unfortunately, this doesn't mean just active smokers, but even folks that have smoked 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Unlike things like uh, lung cancer, where your risk essentially goes back down to zero once you've quit for an extended period of time, damage to your blood vessels done even at a very young age is, is not reversible if you stop smoking. That being said, it's a huge part of what we do in terms of trying to get folks uh, off cigarettes. Uh, 
um, and really any tobacco. So anything that contains nicotine, uh, there's even some association with marijuana causing damage to blood vessels. So that's a big one. Uh, high cholesterol, the next probably biggest thing, high blood pressure, diabetes for sure, and then other things associated with high cholesterol, et cetera, obesity and sedentary lifestyle. So you don't want to be the uh, couch potato there. So I don't know if this is something people are familiar with. So there's a, what's called the Framingham Heart Study. Uh, and uh, so this was a study where people uh, were studied in the town of Framingham, Massachusetts for an extended period of time. It's pretty impressive because they looked at these patients for literally 30 or 40 years and followed uh, various different things. So looking specifically at peripheral vascular disease. So what were the increased risks uh, factors? So again, sort of just like that last slide, the wrong button here. Smoking, number one, giving you about a five-fold risk compared to non-smokers diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Uh, homocysteine is something we measure in the blood. These are sort of blood levels. Interesting, and I'm not trying to encourage it, but alcohol was actually a little bit protective from developing peripheral vascular disease. So kind of an odd thing, but shows up there. So what is the disease evolution? So how do patients sort of first figure out that maybe this is something they have? So the first thing they develop is something called claudication. And so claudication we'll get to in a bit, but it's derived from the Latin word to limp. Uh, so you start to develop pain when you walk. And it's pretty specific that it occurs at certain distances um, and over time, and particularly in the calf, but sometimes in the buttock or in the hips, people will complain of it. As disease progresses and you get less blood down your legs, this goes on to what's called rest pain. So as implied by the name, it's pain that develops primarily in your foot um, and uh, at rest when you're not doing something. Sort of as things go down, ultimately you can have a spontaneous ulceration or skin breakdown and you'll typically see it in the place that's farthest away from your heart, which um, as seen in this picture is usually, you know, things like the tips of your toes. In a very worst case scenario, we go on to things like gangrene, and this is an early situation where you have this with a little bit of black spot here. Uh, and then ultimately in the very worst case scenario, limb loss. Uh, so something requiring an amputation. So it's important that this is recognized early, hopefully, you know, even before you reach this stage so that we can treat things like um, uh, blockage in your blood vessels to prevent limb loss. So this whole sort of schematic beyond the claudication patients, we'd group together in something called critical limb ischemia. So ischemia is a general term for lack of blood supply, and as it implies sort of critical, once you reach this point, it's very concerning that ultimately you may end up losing your limb. Patients with claudication overall tend to do okay, and I'll get to a slide on this. Uh, if you look all comers, about a third of them will get a little bit worse, a third of them get better, and a third of them stay the same over the course of their lifetime. So going back to that uh, claudication, so again, it's the Latin word for limp, so reproducible exercise in a group of muscles uh, at a set distance, and then it's relieved with rest. So essentially, when you're at rest, plenty of blood supply to your leg. When you start to walk, the muscles need more oxygen, nutrients, and so forth. Your body can't overcome the blockage that you have, and you lead to this crampy sensation. Um, and location depends sort of where the disease is. So if you have disease up in the pelvis, uh, then you typically affect one level down, so meaning your buttocks or hips. If uh, you have disease in your thigh blood vessel, then it typically affects the calf. And patients are, are really pretty consistent about this, and this differs from other uh, causes of leg pain where you know, they're pretty consistent that you know, at a block, you know, my leg does this, uh, at, you know, a quarter mile, whatever it is, but you know, it doesn't matter in the weather, it doesn't matter about you know, whether they ate something different or the time of day, it's pretty consistent. The one thing that usually shortens it, if they're working harder, meaning they're going up an incline or going up a flight of stairs, they may notice it as well at a shorter distance. So uh, some other signs or symptoms. So crampiness or pain, particularly in the feet, uh, that often will disturb sleep. Sores or wounds on toes, feet, or legs, particularly, again, sort of in the, in the distal, meaning the end part of your foot. Um, color changes. Oftentimes people will say, oh, my foot has turned pretty white. Sometimes a sort of bluish hue to your foot. Lower temperature in one leg compared to the next. So oftentimes patients complain, particularly at nighttime, my, my feet are very cold. Uh, and then other things like poor nail growth, uh, decreased hair growth. So it's pretty common that people start to lose their hair uh, over the course of their leg. So as I said before, so you know, peripheral vascular disease, sorry, peripheral arterial disease is really a, a marker for systemic disease of your arteries. So all your arteries, although different in size, are really essentially the same at the end of the day. So including the heart ones, including the ones in your leg, belly, et cetera. So when you have some disease in one of them, you have disease in all of them. And whether or not that's enough to cause any symptoms, um, that's a different scenario, but either way, you have enough that it's concerning. 
And what we see is that patients with peripheral vascular disease, overall, their life expectancy is decreased by about 10 years. And if you look at sort of these mortality rates, unfortunately, once you've been diagnosed with this, you have a significantly higher mortality rate compared to someone who doesn't have this. And again, the majority of these deaths aren't related to your leg. They're related to uh, cardiovascular events, obviously having heart attacks and so forth. So <clears throat> there's a few studies that have been done with big groups of patients. And so this is one that was uh, looking at patients, the top lines, so, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button here. Patients that have had a MI or a heart attack. So this is their survival over time. So not unexpectedly, it decreases. Next up is peripheral vascular, sorry, peripheral arterial disease, the red line, and then stroke is below that. So actually having the diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease is actually worse than having had a heart attack. It's a little bit better than having a stroke, but again, a marker that uh, unfortunately this is a systemic disease and your chance of survival is not the same as those without it. Something that's kind of showing the same thing here. So the top line is normal subjects that don't have any heart disease or peripheral vascular disease. This is asymptomatic patients that have uh, arterial disease as well as have had a heart attack, uh, symptomatic patients, and then the severe symptomatic patients, so those ones that are grouped into that what's called CLI or critical limb ischemia. So significant blockage in their blood vessels and, and significant problems with their heart. And uh, this is looking at their mortality, which again is quite significant over time. So this isn't the fate of everybody, but uh, this is important. So this is a, looking at uh, patients that come in to see a physician. So say you know, you're complaining of intermittent claudication, pain in your calf when you're walking a set distance. And when you look over time, so this is 100 patients, and this is over the course of five years. So uh, these numbers are a little skewed. I think it's a one-third, one-third, one-third. But in this study, about 50% will go on to improve a bit. About a quarter will stay the same, and a quarter will worsen. And of those that worsen, uh, a small number of those will actually need an intervention, but a not small number, and this probably is a little bit higher, 2 to 5% will actually end up with an amputation, so uh, requiring to have some part of the leg removed. Uh, also importantly then, again, these patients, if you look uh, over time, and this is a five-year time, so again, starting point five years later, uh, during that time, unfortunately, 30 patients will die, and again, the vast majority of these have some sort of cardiac event related to probably a myocardial infarction or heart attack, the most common. And then, uh, again, a not small number two will have a non-fatal uh, cardiovascular event, typically, again, a heart attack that they don't die from, but is a significant impact on their overall health. And then about half of them will survive without having any cardiac events. So I think, again, importantly, peripheral vascular or peripheral arterial disease is important uh, in terms of treating your legs, but it's a big marker for uh, systemic disease as well. So how do we diagnose this? So clinical history and, and examination are sort of the big two things, and, and you can get a lot of the story from a patient, uh, and by examining them as well, you're going to learn sort of most of what you need to know. Beyond that, we do what's called non-invasive vascular studies, which, as they sound, are non-invasive, so more commonly ultrasounds, uh, and then what's called an ankle brachial index, which I'll show you next. And then beyond that, once you've made these sort of non-invasive uh, testing, you, you typically then do some radiologic testing. And whether that's what's called an angiogram or uh, CT scans or MRIs can be used uh, to look at blockages throughout your body. So again, clinical history is sort of one of the biggest things, looking at the risk factors. Beyond that, these exercise and do symptoms. So this, again, intermittent claudication, I keep saying it again and again. But again, calf or buttock pain, cause the patient to stop walking, resolves within five to 10 minutes of rest. Rest pain, as I described again, this is pain typically in the forefoot. It typically occurs at night, uh, and it's typically alleviated when the foot's placed in a dependent position. So when you have significant blockages to the point where you develop rest pain, your body's relying upon gravity. So during the course of the day, you're walking, you're sitting in a chair, it's not such a big ordeal. You tend to lay flat, obviously, to sleep. At that point, gravity no longer helps out your foot. So patients have less blood supply to their foot, and they'll wake up two to three hours into sleep. And sort of on their own, most patients can figure out that, oh, if I hang my foot over the bed or I stand up for a minute or two, that pain goes away. So that allows gravity, again, to help sort of that last bit of blood get down there. Um, and then beyond that, sort of the next step in, in severity of disease is ulceration, so skin breakdown uh, of uh, particularly the distal foot and toes and sometimes the heel as well. So 
many people don't think that they uh, have, or many people don't have, sort of these classic typical signs and symptoms of disease, and they have, you know, pain when walking, and until you take a good history, you don't understand that that's the source of it. And, uh, you know, we'll see patients who have had a workup for, you know, their hip, they've had a workup for their back, they've had a workup for various things before someone thinks that, oh, uh, maybe I should check to see if they have pulses in their foot and so forth. Um, and, and two, I think there's, there's a handful of patients that, uh, you know, think, uh, you know, I'm getting older, this is just part of getting older, I can't walk as far, and kind of live with it. And, uh, you know, I think we're all probably guilty of saying those things, but, um, you know, if it's lifestyle limiting and the point you can't do what you want to do, um, there are things we can do to help. So this is a, a series of pretty simple questions that oftentimes that will ask. Um, so do you get pain or discomfort when you walk? Yes. Does this pain ever start when you're standing still or sitting? No. So typically you won't ever get this pain when you're not doing anything. Uh, does it uh, get a little bit worse when you walk uphill or you try to walk faster? Yes. Uh, do you get it when you walk at an ordinary pace? Yes. And does it disappear after you rest? Uh, yes. And uh, typically then does this occur specifically in a set area? So not, oh, my whole leg hurts, but specifically Every time I walk, my left calf cramps up and it gives me pain after five minutes or a walk block or whatever it is. So when you answer these questions, this becomes a pretty sensitive and pretty specific uh, thing that, you know, you pass these questions, there's a pretty good chance that you have peripheral arterial disease causing that. So that being said, there's a million reasons that patients can have leg pain, and this is just sort of a couple highlights. So within the world of vascular, and we'll get to this um, if time allows. So venous disease, or the, the veins, can affect uh, your walking as well. Uh, neurospinal, so particularly patients that have some uh, lumbar or low back disc pain, uh, and those patients that have spinal stenosis. So when the spinal cord uh, gets compressed, oftentimes walking just the same will lead to pain uh, as you walk. Oftentimes patients that have spinal stenosis uh, feel better when they lean forward a little bit. That alleviates some of that stenosis. So oftentimes patients describe, you know, I, I struggle, but you know, when I go to the grocery store, I can walk the entire way because I'm leaning on the cart and my back's bent a little bit. Uh, so that's kind of one of these things, cheap way of figuring out whether it's your blood vessels or not. Um, so neuropathy, oftentimes in long-term diabetics, will develop some chronic pain in both feet. Uh, chronic alcohol abuse as well is associated with some neuropathy. And then, again, very common things, musculoskeletal. So as you get older, lots of people develop arthritis. And uh, one of the keys here from our standpoint is sort of figuring out if there's variation with weather time of day. So oftentimes people with arthritis, they're most stiff and, and comfortable early part of the day. As the day goes on, they feel better. We live in Southern California, so the cold weather doesn't really exist, but maybe on a day like this morning, you feel a little bit cool and the joints aren't working quite as well. <clears throat> so a few things to sort of help differentiate these. So again, claudication related to PAD, um, you're gonna see uh, cramping, gradual onset, relieved by standing still. Again, patients will localize to a, a specific muscle group, whether it's a calf or a buttock or a thigh. Uh, usually one leg's affected, but certainly both can be affected. When patients have venous disease causing claudication, they often describe a throbbing discomfort. You know, you can see the same thing where it's gradual or um, can be immediate. Uh, it's usually relieved by elevating the leg. Uh, and it usually involves the entire leg. So patients say, oh, my whole leg just sort of throbs over the course of the day. And again, usually this is one leg. Looking at neurogenic, so related to something to do with spinal stenosis or perhaps lumbar discs that have slipped out of place, uh, oftentimes patients will say it's a sort of shock-like pain. And, and typically it, it's immediate, but it can be inconsistent. Sometimes patients say when you know, I'm trying to carry something or I walk a certain way, it hurts. Um, usually relieve when patients either sit or bend forward as I described before. And generally, it's pretty unlo like poorly localized. So patients say, oh, it starts in my butt, goes down my leg, and kind of shoots this way, rather than saying, oh, it's just my calf, it's just my thigh. And, and because it's your back and your spinal cord, usually it's both legs that are, causing, are uh, affected by that. So uh, location, location, location. So um, blood vessels like to affect uh, a level below. So when patients have uh, buttock or hip complaints, this is usually uh, related to aorta iliac or pelvic disease. So the aorta is this blood vessel. Sorry, I cut this guy off here, but up here is your heart. Here comes your aorta. At the level of your belly button, that blood vessel splits into two. Essentially, one branch goes on to feed each leg. Uh, and then in the leg, they, uh, what's called bifurcate or divide a few more times. So um, <clears throat> the one thing that goes along when you have aorta iliac disease, particularly for men, or specifically for men, you can develop some uh, impotence, and that's uh, called Lariche syndrome. So patients that have buttock or uh, thigh claudication along with impotence 
usually due to blockages in their blood vessels in the pelvis. As you move down, uh, the thigh blood vessels, the common femoral artery, which is this one here in the groin, uh, if that's blocked off, it usually affects most of the leg, the thigh and the calf alone. If it's just your calf, typically it's what's called the superficial femoral artery or this main artery that runs down through the uh, thigh. So um, hopefully as a vascular surgeon we're doing this, hopefully a regular doctor is doing this, but when you're examined, uh, you know, you should be examined with your pants and your shoes off and your socks off because it's important to actually look at your feet and, and feel pulses and so forth. So, you know, things we look for are lack of pulses, uh, bruise, which is basically a noise that when a stethoscope is put over your blood vessel, you might hear some of the bl turbulent blood flow and some um, noise related to that. Uh, hair loss, particularly down uh, below your knee, poor nail growth, dry uh, skin, dependent rubor, so that just basically means when your leg is hanging down that your foot will turn bright red, uh, and that then it'll be an exaggerated response when you lift up the leg, it turns ghost white. Uh, so that occurs in everybody to some mild extent, but when you see this, again, it's bright, bright red and ghost, ghost white when you do these moves. Uh, and then ulceration, or again, spontaneous breakdown of the skin, or, and the worst case scenario, you know, uh, gangrenous changes where you see some black skin, uh, particularly around the level of the toes. Uh, I think the other thing too is important that you know if you've had a wound in your foot that you know developed you know you're walking on the beach or you stub your toe and you know it used to heal in a week's time now it's going on three four five weeks oftentimes that's related to poor blood supply causing that um, to heal so slowly so that's something that should be alerted to as well. So uh, sort of the bread and butter uh, first test that we get is something called an ankle brachial index or it's also known as an ABI. And this essentially is comparing the blood pressure in your arm to the blood pressure at your ankle. And the assumption is that your blood pressure in any blood vessel should essentially be the same. So uh, this is just some math, so dividing those numbers, if they're the same, it should be one. Um, assuming you have lower blood pressure at your ankle compared to your arm, uh, you start to have a number less than one. And as that number you know, gets closer and closer to zero, uh, that is an indicator of worse disease. So typically when patients have claudication, they're sort of in this 0.75 range. And once they develop breast pain, they get closer to 0.5. And when they develop things like spontaneous skin breakdown, it's usually less than 0.5. So this is, a, again, sort of bread and butter thing that we do. It's done relatively simply. You need a blood pressure cuff and what's called a Doppler, basically this uh, machine that some of you probably have seen that we listen to blood vessels with. So again, we take the blood pressure. It should be done in both arms and then the blood pressure of both legs at two different spots one artery here behind your ankle and one artery on your foot. Uh, and you basically, again, divide the higher of those two numbers, both from the arms and for the legs, and come up with that measurement. And it's actually a pretty simple test that we can do, and it's just one value, but there's actually quite a bit of data related to this. And this goes back to, again, the same idea that once you have peripheral vascular disease, it's a marker for uh, cardiovascular disease as well. And uh, so this is looking at uh, the association between a decreased ABI and the increased risk of cardiovascular death. So unfortunately, this slide is sort of backwards the way I would think about it. Um, but these are normal ABIs. But as you move across, the ABI is going down. And as you go across, you see this is what's called all-cause mortality or death from you know, any event, and then cardiovascular death. So all these things go up significantly as your ABI goes down. So it's, again, a marker for disease, and it's actually a numeric marker for disease that you can use as well. So after the, non, uh, sorry, after the ABI, typically what we do is what we call non-invasive testing, and specifically usually vascular ultrasound. So ultrasound's a nice test. It's non-invasive other than some cold jelly on your leg. It gives us some pretty good pictures of your blood vessels, as you see here. We can measure the speed of the blood going through this, and we can see blockages reasonably well. Uh, oftentimes then we'll get what's called a CT angiogram. So this is essentially a CAT scan, but it's done specifically to look at your blood vessels. Um, so these are done with contrast dye, which is given through an IV. And uh, you can end up with some nice pretty pictures that look like this. The one issue here, so it is some radiation. A CAT scan is not a ton of radiation, but if you're getting 10 CAT scans a year, that adds up. But importantly, the contrast dye is something that we always get concerned about, because the contrast dye can affect your kidneys. And uh, if you have normal kidney function, generally that's not an issue. Uh, but if you have some impaired kidney function for one reason or the other, uh, we try to avoid that. So sometimes we then get what's called an MR angiogram. So it's an MRI as you think about it, but again, specifically done to look at your blood vessels. Uh, 
Oftentimes, this is going to be done without the IV contrast. So if your kidney function is particularly bad, we'll, we'll do that usually first. So next, how do, how do we treat this disease? So, you know, there's a lot of risk factor modifications. So, and again, we're treating not just the leg, but treating sort of your whole body. And one of the biggest things is smoking cessation. So patients uh, that are able to get off cigarettes typically notice some improvement in their legs if they're smoking at baseline. So nicotine has a, a vasoconstrictive effect, meaning it clamps down your blood vessels. So even just getting off cigarettes for a week or two, those blood vessels will actually open up a little bit and uh, patients will have some improvement in their walking. Uh, hyperlipidemia, so managing your cholesterol. So I'm sure everybody in this room has heard that you know statins are the greatest thing ever, and, and in general we do think that these statin medications tend to be pretty good for your blood vessels. Uh, other things, blood pressure control, making sure your diabetes is under control, and then specifically to your blood vessels, uh, we think that pretty much anybody with uh, peripheral arterial disease should be on an antiplatelet. Uh, so this is typically just an aspirin, but the other drugs are things like Plavix or Clopidogrel. Um, uh, uh, what's the other one? I'm blank here. Uh, Avalox, a couple others that you can be on. So um, specifically, usually I just have patients on an aspirin. So the idea here is that it thins out your blood just a tiny bit, and you've probably seen the ads for Bear that also too, if one of these plaques is ever to rupture, that's usually the source of why you have a heart attack. That little bit of blood clot forms there, then it acutely uh, blocks off that blood vessel. Statins, as I mentioned before, so salazazole is a medication that uh, is also known as Pletol. Um, so it's a medication that's given for claudication. It's a medication that actually, uh, despite being studied a bunch, nobody knows specifically how it works. People think that it, it enables blood cells to be a little more uh, pliable. Uh, there's probably some antiplatelet therapy, so it thins out your blood a little bit as well. Um, and people that can tolerate it do have some improvement in their walking. That being said, a lot of patients that are on this medication have had issues with GI upset, diarrhea, and so most patients don't do so well with it. And then the other thing is exercise therapy. So uh, the idea that you're walking and trying to force your uh, body on its own to make its own little bypasses is, is pretty effective. Um, so typically what we'll do is if we see a patient that says, you know, I can only go for five minutes and then I have horrible calf pain, so what we'll tell them to do is, is walk those five minutes, rest, walk another five minutes, rest, and do that consistently, meaning for 30, 40 minutes, um, you know, four to five times a week. So in general, that sounds like a great idea, and that is, is helpful. And, and when you looked at it, when it was looked at in, in various studies, it helped walk your, increase your walking distance by about 150%, so pretty reasonable distance. Uh, but unfortunately, those patients that improved are those that were in, in um, supervised uh, regimens, meaning that they went somewhere, someone told them you need to walk, they did the walking, and so forth. When you tell patients, and I'm guilty as this as anybody, to do, go do something, not everybody is so compliant about saying, I'm going to do it. But it's, re it's, you know, it's uh, really rewarding when patients actually do it, and uh, they will improve their walking distance for sure. So especially patients that are really kind of hesitant to ever have anything done, and their walking isn't so, so impairing, they want to improve it just a bit, it's a great way to do it. Moving forward, uh, the next thing we do is what's called endovascular techniques that we'll get into next, and then uh, surgical intervention. So just a little more data. So this is looking at statins. So you know, I think if uh, you, know, you turn on the television these days and open a magazine, there's statin ads everywhere. And uh, you know, statins are good, and they've shown to improve um, uh, coronary uh, outcomes. But as well, this is a study, it's called the REACH Registry. So it looked at uh, over 5,000 patients over four years. Uh, and you can see, so on statin is yellow, not on statins are red, and essentially uh, for all comers in terms of peripheral arterial disease, it helps. So it helped limit their worsening PAD. Um, this is controlled for various risks. Uh, it helped worsening claudication. It helped having to undergo a limb revascularization, and it had lower risk of amputation with it. So pretty compelling when you look at the fact that it's over 5,000 patients that it's pretty reasonable. And statins generally are pretty well tolerated. Some patients have some muscle complaints. You need to have your blood checked periodically for your liver, in, in specifically. Uh, but generally, they're pretty well tolerated medications. So then, what, what patients do we really treat in terms of procedures, interventions? And I think it's important that this should, these should be symptomatic patients. So this is one of these things, just because you have, doesn't mean that it needs to be fixed. Um, and so patients that are symptomatic are those that have lifestyle limiting claudication. So, you know, there's patients that say, oh, you know, my calf cramps when I walk a half mile, but I only walk a half mile when I, you know, go to Disneyland with my grandkid. You know, if that's not something you do every week, it's probably not that important. That being said, there's still people that might be working and they say, you know, I can't do my job because every time I walk, I, I'm limited, so I'm limited what I do at work. 
So lifestyle limiting claudication. And lifestyle limiting obviously is specific to that person. If someone's you know, 95 and lives in a nursing home, it's probably not as important as a you know, 70 year old who's still active and wants to do a bunch of things. Rest pain, uh, you know, so most patients that, you know, don't want to have pain in their foot at night, and I think that's a pretty good indication uh, to do something. And then certainly non-healing wounds, ulceration, and gangrene. So once these things are developed, really, uh, these are kind of uh, for sure things that we should end up treating. So <clears throat> if you look, uh, this is looking at a comparison of endovascular interventions, so doing things with balloons and stents. Uh, compared to surgery and amputation. And this is a little bit dated now, but looking at the decade from 96 to 2006. And just like in the heart, a lot less people were having heart bypasses and instead were having stents put in the heart. Uh, we were a little bit slower to do that, but over to this 10 year time period, you see this is endovascular interventions or balloons and stents really went up. Old fashioned bypass surgery went down. And during that same time, amputation went down. So, you know, uh, these aren't probably directly related, but perhaps that you're pre preventing some of these amputations. So really, what is endovascular surgery? So essentially, it's minimally invasive techniques to uh, treat blockages in the arteries as well as the veins. Uh, very similar to a heart catheterization. I kind of see it as the equivalent to laparoscopy. So in general surgery, when you go in the belly, it's far uh, less common to have a big incision. Much more commonly, uh, guys do things laparoscopically. So the same idea here. Rather than these big open operations, we do things with minimally invasive techniques. So these procedures are typically done uh, with local anesthesia, plus minus with some sedation medication, typically don't need the breathing tube. Uh, they're usually performed as outpatients. Most patients end up spending a day in the hospital, but it's pretty unusual you have to spend the night in the hospital. So uh, these are typically done in these, these fancy looking rooms that combine uh, an x-ray machine along with an operating room type table. Uh, most of these rooms too, if we need to do some sort of open surgery, we have the ability to do that. But more often than not, we just do these through little punctures in the, in the groin blood vessels. So, you know, a few basic steps, and we'll go through these things, but typically the first step is to enter a blood vessel. Uh, most commonly, we do this in the groin, just like is done for uh, heart catheterizations. Uh, we take pictures of the arteries. Once more, we do use that contrast dye, so we just need to be aware of how much we're giving somebody. Uh, if we see a blockage, then we try to cross that blockage. Uh, typically, then we balloon, or what's called atherectomy. So atherectomy is basically a term for uh, cleaning out the artery, and I'll show you some slides on that. And then uh, oftentimes we'll then stent or use a, uh, a metal lattice to keep that blockage open. And then at the end, we take a few more pictures and then typically can close the entry site of the artery. So sort of in the old days, uh, we didn't have these what's called closure devices, so everybody had their groin pushed on for 20 or 30 minutes, and most people that had a heart catheterization remember that, and they say they never want that again, which is also very reasonable. So much more commonly, we use basically little plugs that can help close this up, and it allows you to get up earlier and go home earlier. So in terms of going into blood vessels, so you know we, we give you a bunch of local numbing medication, then utilize a, a needle, go in the blood vessel, we pass a wire. Ultimately, we put in these things called sheaths. Um, so these sheaths enable us to put in other devices through them, but this stays in throughout the course of the procedure, then obviously we remove this at the end. So this is what it looks like once it's in uh, your groin blood vessel. Uh, it's got a little attachment here that you can um, flush and, and push contrast through or medications through as well. So, you know, I, I say this to people and I say, well, I'm going to balloon up your artery and I realize that probably sounds pretty silly because conceptually we think of a balloon. And so it's not really this kind of balloon that we're thinking about. Um, and it's much more this kind of long skinny balloon, which you don't make into like an animal or anything, but um, you do use uh, this kind of balloon. So this is a, an angioplasty balloon. Uh, that we utilize. So this actually has a tiny little hole that we pass in over the length of a wire and then use to treat uh, a blockage. So again, just a schematic here. So you've done those pictures, you've seen your blockage, you're able to get through it, you put up this balloon, you inflate this for typically one to three minutes depending on where it is, and then afterwards you see the, usually a pretty good resolution of that. So atherectomy, uh, this is sort of the roto-rooter um, of uh, blood vessels. So patients often say, oh, you're going to use that roto-rooter thing, and uh, it, it sort of mimics this. It's cleaning out your pipe, so to speak. Um, so there's a bunch of different devices that we have. So same story here, blocked artery. So we have something called directional atherectomy. So these are pretty nifty. This actually has a little rotating blade that essentially rotates at about uh, 500 rotations per second and can actually just eat up plaque. Uh, there's another one here that's rotational where this whole thing is actually uh, coated with tiny little bits of diamond and helps shave this down. Uh, Transluminal extraction, same idea, essentially is rotational. 
And then this is kind of falling out the wayside, but there's actually a laser device that you can actually literally burn and laser through these blockages. So when we do this, you can imagine, you know, we're, we're stirring up some of this plaque and we don't want this to go downstream because that can affect the blood vessels sort of downstream from that. So oftentimes uh, we'll use these what's called filters. So these are uh, kind of like um, little sieves that you would use. So it allows blood to go through, but it doesn't allow particles to go through. So these things are actually pretty tiny and, and a few millimeters in size. And, and once we're done, we, we can pull these things out and, and collect all that extra debris that we didn't want to go down into the foot. And then oftentimes you hear about stents, and, and stents, uh, again, very similar to the heart, uh, are these uh, metal, and it's typically nitinol or it's stainless steel. So nitinol is an alloy that's made of uh, nickel and titanium, and uh, these go in uh, collapsed, and these are what's called self-expanding. So just as it sounds, as you open them up, they expand on their own, and these are kind of uh, springy little things that if you had in your hand, you can kind of feel. The legs, uh, sorry, the blood vessels in your legs really tend to move quite a bit, um, so they're pretty pliable. So obviously your leg probably doesn't do 360 degrees like this, but they are able to turn over time. And early on, even like a decade ago, uh, a lot of these stents were fracturing because they weren't designed for all the motion within the leg. And nowadays the stents are actually much better, the design is better, so the, the issue of fracture is pretty low. Um, we have some what's called covered stents. So these are stents that have fabric within them, and there are certain situations where you're very concerned about some old blood clot that you don't want to have go somewhere else, um, and we'll use these. And then as well, beyond the self-expanding, we have what's called balloon expandable. So they come mounted on one of these small balloons. You inflate the balloon at the area of some blockage, pull the balloon out, and the stent is left in place. Um, so I should have brought one, but these are sort of stents. And, and just, you know, I don't know if you guys had a heart stent. It's the, really the exact same idea, uh, just a little bit bigger for your blood vessels that are in your legs. So um, these things can be used really essentially anywhere. So this is femoral popliteal disease, so meaning in your thigh and behind your knee. Uh, so this is a picture of a blockage here. You see a balloon here that's being inflated. So when we use the balloons, we put a little of the same contrast dye so we can see exactly where it is and the blockage that we're treating. Same idea here, so this is your uh, thigh bone. And again, we do all these things under x-ray, take a bunch of pictures and get a sense exactly where things are. And then afterwards, blood flow here. So same idea here. So this is, uh, for reference, your thigh blood vessel. So if you can see here, that's the start of what was once the normal blood vessel. Here's the, the end part of it where it comes back. So this is what I sort of describing these, what's called collaterals, or all these tiny little blood vessels. Your body has most of these, but they're pretty small. And then over time, when you develop a blockage of the main one, these tend to grow in size and work harder. So. Again, I like to show a good before and after, so beforehand, and then this is with a bunch of stents in place, and now you see blood flow going through there where there wasn't before. Uh, this is taking a look at your pelvis. So this is, again, that aorta, the blood vessel in your belly that splits into two. You can see a couple areas of blockage here, which were treated with stents, and a much nicer picture here. So the one thing over the course of these procedures, oftentimes uh, your kidneys will empty out some of this contrast. So this is actually the patient's bladder. So we'll see that pretty typically it fills up. So we just have to be wary that we don't give you too much fluid and don't wait too long doing these things. Generally, these procedures can be done in an hour or two. Uh, and like I said, typically just with sedation medication. So that being said, we, we still do some open surgery where we make incisions and, and do bypasses and what's called endarterectomy. So endarterectomy is essentially a fancy term for cleaning out the inside of a blood vessel and closing it up. Uh, and then as well, too, we do some what's called debridements where we clean up some, you know, tissue and, and then amputations, obviously, we're trying to avoid. Um, so bypasses, as they sound, just like in the heart, you're bypassing, you're going around an area of blockage. Here's one in the thigh coming from the groin blood vessel down to the knee vessel. Sometimes we go across from one groin to the other. This is one going in the belly. Um, and so, you know, <clears throat> Bypasses really can be performed really anywhere throughout the leg. Uh, we, we generally like to use your own vein. So you have an extra vein called the saphenous vein, which often gets taken out for a, a heart bypass. But when it's not, we like to use that vein. These, unfortunately, do require general or spinal anesthesia. And there's you know a prolonged hospitalization, generally three to five days, and generally a solid couple months before you fully recover. And sorry for the sort of gruesome picture, but you know in general, we, we do make these pretty big incisions. And that's one issue with bypass. You can imagine these are done on legs that the blood supply isn't normal, so the healing of these wounds can be an issue. And upwards of about 20% of patients will have an issue with healing just the surgical wounds, let alone if there was a wound in the foot that we did for in the first place. So 
it's still you know a uh, gold standard and I think it works very well but it's probably going to go by the wayside in the next probably 10 to 20 years I would think just because we're coming up with better techniques uh, skip this one so unfortunately blockages do come back and this is what I mean that you know we could improve upon things so um, when they come back early, generally that's been some technical issue. So, of course, you know, we uh, hate to admit fault, but usually, you know, what you've done should work certainly longer than 30 days. So, and, and technical issue meaning that, you know, there was some blockage that was missed. Uh, perhaps the stent should have been put in a centimeter longer, some issue like that. Or when you're doing a bypass that it's called tunnel or you connected it a wrong way or something of that sort. This is, thank goodness, pretty rare. Um, Midterm failures, this is sort of the bane of vascular surgery. So just like on the outside, anytime you cause damage to your tissue, your body reacts and it likes to form some scar tissue. So when you do this to arteries and veins both, uh, you end up with what's called intimal hyperplasia. So the intima is the inside lining of the blood vessel. And so you can imagine these balloons work great, they balloon things up, but they've stretched a bunch of tissue. And your body's response to that is try to cause some scar, and it's called hyperplasia, or increased growth of the in inward lining. So that'll lead to narrowing of the blood vessel that you've just tried to open. Um, so we're, we're coming up with some techniques to try to avoid that. And one of the things now, oftentimes, uh, we'll use what's called drug-coated balloons, or balloons that have uh, sort of the same things that we use for immunosuppression. So in someone who's had an organ transplant, medications that help you know, decrease the amount of inflammation. And then long-term failures, uh, you know, these we see beyond two years. And this, unfortunately, like I said, is progressive disease. There's nothing that we can do to necessarily stop it. Um, and you'll see progressions of blockages one way, one way, either above or below your bypass or within your, uh, below your stent. So <clears throat> unlike a lot of surgical fields, uh, this is uh, vascular differs in that patients are really seen lifelong. Certainly once you've had an intervention, it's not like, oh, I had my hernia fixed, the doctor checked the wound, and he never saw me again. Um, patients that have had bypass, that have had stents, uh, all these things need to be surveyed for all those reasons I just showed in the slide before, that we want to have these blockages not come back. So uh, we survey these, meaning we keep an eye on them, typically with things like ultrasound and that same non-invasive testing. Along the way, you know, we, we do the medical side of things along with your primary care doctor of reinforcing these risk factors. So if you're stop smoking, staying off the cigarettes, if you're diabetic, keeping an eye on your glucose, uh, if you have high cholesterol, making sure you're taking your medications and so forth. So, you know, in conclusion, this is a really prevalent disease. It's, I think it's very underdiagnosed and undertreated, um, and, and it, it shouldn't be because it is associated with pretty high, uh, not only morbidity and side effects, but mortality, again, primarily related to heart disease. So I think it's something that uh, should be and, and hopefully can be diagnosed early. And uh, I, I think that's sort of, you know, part of me being here is just to bring that to attention of uh, people in the community. So I think I'll stop there and we can open up for questions. I, I have some other slides on vein stuff, but we could say that for another day as looks like I'm at my time there. And what I'm going to ask you to do to repeat the questions. Repeat the questions. Okay, no problem. Great. I wasn't quite clear with the balloon. The stents remain in, but the balloons, is that just during the procedure and then they're removed just to open up? The Correct. So uh, the, question, the question was about balloons and stents and what we do them. So the balloons uh, we, we use once uh, or twice, but they don't stay in your body. So we balloon up, again, for a minute to three minutes. We remove it, take some pictures. Uh, the stents, however, are, are left in place permanently. And it's pretty unusual you would ever take these out. Um, so they're metal, they stay there forever. You can go through a, a metal detector, that's always a question, but they stay there forever. Question in the back there? Uh, is there any connection with Raynaud's disease? Right, so the, the question, I'm just gonna repeat it. So the question was, was there any association with Raynaud's disease? So just for everybody to know, Raynaud's, so this is what's called a vasospastic disorder. So essentially patients, you know, all of us when we go into a cold, our, our blood vessels like to clamp down. So your body's smart, it likes to maintain blood to your brain, to your heart, to your organs. So your extremities, your toes, your fingers tend to get cold. So Raynaud's is an exaggeration of that, where you go out into the cold or you expose your hands to cold and, and they turn uh, certain colors, usually generally white, and then they'll flush back to purple and it can be painful as well. So it's kind of a separate beast. It involves your blood vessels, but in terms of uh, peripheral arterial disease, it's a, a bit separate. So it does affect your arteries, but it's a separate disease than hardening of the arteries and, and uh, atherosclerosis, as we've described here. Question? Um, can stents be used in a patient with artificial heart valves? So the question was, can stents be used in patients with artificial heart valves? And yes, they certainly can. There's no problem they couldn't be. Um, 
Uh, so the one thing with heart valves, oftentimes patients are on certain blood thinners, and so we just have to be wary of that. Because these types of procedures, we do have to stop certain blood thinners, usually not the things like aspirin or Plavix or Clopidogrel, but things like Coumadin or Eliquis or these sort of stronger ones we'll have to stop. So sometimes, you know, if you have artificial heart valve that you're taking that for, we just need to figure out with your doctor how much we can stop, when we can stop it, if you need other blood thinners in the meantime and so forth. But if anything, yeah, being on the blood thinners, we think probably helps this a bit. Question there? Um, yeah, I just want to open up with first that my mother died of this. She had both her legs amputated below the knee because of this. And um, I've unfortunately inherited it from her. So the, you mentioned more than once the morbidity rate uh, that this takes 10 years off our lives even after treatment. Is that true, even after treatment? So, you know, the, definitely that, that number goes down a bit with treatment because, you know, again, the general thing is not just treatment of your legs, but treatment of your heart, of your carotid arteries, and so forth. So you can improve upon that, uh, but still having that diagnosis, it really doesn't push it back that much because, again, it's a marker for other disease. Question there? Yeah. Uh, during uh, angioplasty, where you're completely uh, obstructing blood flow in order to uh, enlarge the uh, artery. Um, uh, how do you prevent a, a cardiovascular event from occurring if you completely cut off all blood flow while, while undergoing the procedure during that one minute or two minutes that you're working with the balloon? Right. So, so the question here was, um, how do you prevent issues when you're uh, blocking off a, a blood vessel completely during angioplasty? So, um, so uh, during these procedures, once we've decided to do an intervention, we, we systemically, meaning we give you blood thinners that would make your blood quite thin. So typically we give heparin, uh, which is a blood thinner that thins your blood out and is a short-acting medication. So we're able then to balloon up something and not worry about blood clot forming above the balloon. Um, and as well, from a, from a heart standpoint, we're not stopping blood supply to the heart, just merely to some part of your leg. So it's, it's not unusual, actually, as we do that, that patients will complain, oh, you know, my calf or my foot is really hurting as you do that. And then once the balloon goes down and your restored blood flow, it usually goes away. So the biggest thing is that we thin out your blood as we do that, so we don't form blood clot. Any other questions? Thank you so much. All right. Thank you very much.